IFRS 15 is the new standard for revenue recognition. It brings a lot of new concepts and new requirements which look familiar but are in fact slightly different in the way that they operate from where we are now and can have a very significant effect on the way that companies record revenue. It starts with a new five-step model for revenue recognition and then the first step is that revenue recognition is no longer based on the transfer of risks and rewards by themselves, it's in the transfer of control. It sounds familiar, but it's very different and it can give rise to some interesting surprises. Well, at the extreme, if you've got a company that doesn't sell anything and generates no revenue, then it's correct that it won't be affected. For anyone else, as soon as you start selling goods and services to customers, then you can expect that there's going to be some work to do and some effects on your top line revenue recognition number. Although we expect companies in all sectors to be affected, from what we've seen so far, the major effects are coming in the telco sector, software and technology, aerospace, defense, construction, and real estate. The common feature to each of those companies and the sectors that they're in is that typically in their contracts they have either work which extends over a number of different accounting periods, so what you might call a long-term contract, or they have contracts which have a number of different goods or services that are bundled into one overall contract with a customer that IFRS 15 requires to be broken out into components. The bit that's initially off-putting about IFRS 15 is that in order to understand its effect, you need to carry out a detailed review of all of your existing sales contracts. And it's only once you've done that and analyzed them that you can understand the effect. So that really has resulted in people pushing the project back down the priorities list a little bit. However, what we've also seen is that even if there isn't a particularly significant effect in the amount of revenue that's reported, in terms of timing or profile of recognition, the disclosure requirements are different as well, and that in itself can require a significant amount of work and sometimes new systems and processes in order to gather the required information. One of the requirements of IFRS 15 is to identify items that it calls distinct. And these are items that can be sold separately to a customer or a customer could take what you're selling them and use with something it's already got or could buy from someone else. And this is different from what we've seen under existing standards. The practical effect is that for many companies, particularly where they've given away either extra goods or services that are free or something has been bundled together, is that things are going to need to be separated out. So something that you might have accounted for as a marketing expense before will become something that generates revenue. If I take telcos as an example, if you take out a contract for a mobile phone, frequently in many jurisdictions you'll be given a free handset. And many telcos have accounted for that as a marketing expense or as a deferred cost. IFRS 15, on the other hand, says you've sold a handset to that customer so you have to recognize revenue for that handset up front and then revenue for the services for the airtime or the data transfer evenly over whatever the contract period will be. So it's a very major change. One area where there's a significant change from IFRS 15 is on what it terms variable consideration. And this is where the amount of revenue that you ultimately receive can vary for any reason at all. So that includes for example, where you might issue a credit note or you might accept goods in return and give a refund. There's a high constraint included in IFRS 15 which prevents recognition of revenue unless there's a very high probability that you're not going to reverse it in future. And that's to stop the recognition of revenue in one period followed by a subsequent reversal in another one. The other area to look at quite carefully is transition where there are many options and reliefs on the initial adoption. A key date is the date of initial application, which is the start of the current period when you first adopt the standard, and it's that date in which a number of elections and options need to be decided upon. It's a little bit patchy at the moment, it depends on your jurisdiction, but if we look, for example, at Europe, North America and Australia, 
the securities regulators have been quite active. They've issued public statements saying that they're looking to understand the effects of the new standard on the run-up to its adoption. And this links to some of the disclosure requirements in IFRS which require a public statement in financial statements that are issued prior to adoption of the likely effects of the adoption of the new standard. What we're seeing regulators asking for is a description at least of where the projects are at 31st December 2016, so in the current year-end financial statements, but more importantly in the 30th of June 2017 interim statements, an indication of the quantitative effect. What are the numbers going to look like, even if you can only estimate them? I think that's going to be a real practical challenge for many companies, but it is one where the securities regulators have made the statement. The first thing to do is to work through the standard and understand the actual effects on the timing and profile of revenue recognition and also the knock-on effects on things like performance related pay and banking covenants. There's then a need to think about how to tell the markets, how to tell your brokers and analysts about the effects. Looking internally, you're going to have staff training requirements and this isn't just going to be in the finance department, it's going to be wider than that because people in sales and marketing are going to have to understand what they are, are doing will then affect the amount of revenue that you recognise and when it's recognised. That then might make you think about whether you need to change the terms of some of your sales contracts, whether some of the sales and marketing approaches that you take need to be modified in future and also in your overall staff training needs. For IFRS 15 in particular, you need to have a pretty wide organisational approach to this. It's not just a finance department project, so you need to get a wide range of people involved, particularly from sales and marketing as well. You need to involve people with the right knowledge. One of the problems that we've got, and we're seeing it coming with all of the new standards that we have at the moment, and IFRS 15 is no exception, is that the pool of people with the required knowledge isn't as big as it could be. And that means that there are already pressures coming on the amount of skilled resource that's available to help with those projects. You also need to make sure that you've got sufficient sponsorship for this. The board needs to have this actively on its agenda and you need to brief the audit committee as well. And because this standard brings new concepts and new requirements which aren't familiar, you need to make sure that the board and the audit committee are sufficiently well briefed. One of the other things to watch for is that as time gets short, you usually find with these projects that you start getting out of accounting system adjustments, so Excel spreadsheets and other calculations which are done, which are just a way of getting over the line. That brings an increased risk of error. It also brings something where it's not just a project for this year end, it's a project going forward as you embed the standard fully into the accounting systems and processes.